Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about Justin Hall, Ev Williams, and the invention of blogging and how that led to everything from search and directory to Facebook. Uh, back in 1993, when the World Wide Web had just been invented, it was pretty hard to navigate the thing. You needed a browser. And that's where Mark Andreessen comes in. He's a University of Illinois graduate student, an Iowa-raised, corn-fed kid who went as an engineer to the University of Illinois and created an easy-to-use browser that allowed Tim Berners-Lee's web to be accessible to anybody. It could be, the browser could be downloaded, you could put it on your machine, and instantly you could navigate the web. There was an article in the New York Times in 1993 about it, uh, about this new browser by John Markoff, one of the great uh, writers about uh, the internet. And uh, he had a wonderful lead sentence. It said, think of it, meaning this new browser from Mosaic, as a map to the buried treasures of the information age, a new software program available free to companies and individuals is helping even novice computer users find their way around the global internet. Well, speaking of novice computer users, that's Justin Hall, who was then a sophomore at Swarthmore College, a bit of a kind of odd duck, geeky guy from Chicago. He had loved computers, and he was a rebel, a long-haired rebel who hated authority. And he goes into the student lounge and picks up the New York Times and reads this article. And by the way, this is in 1993. This is before you could read articles like this that easily online. So he was reading the paper edition of the New York Times. And he decides, that's cool. I'm going to download this. And he becomes, in 1993, probably the first influential young person to get onto the World Wide Web and to create a homepage and then start sharing information. In fact, at times, too much information, sharing it in a way that became known as blogging. This is his first homepage. He's at Swarthmore College, and he's describing how he's now going to keep a running web log on all of his activities and the cool things that he finds on the internet. Because back then, Google didn't exist. It was hard to know what actually was on the web, since the web was only about a year old. His home page was kind of uh, cheeky. There he is with Colonel Ali North, the person in the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, and he's just posting pictures with himself and his friends and various people he wants to. But it also got him into the habit of sharing information, sometimes what we call TMI, too much information, but that becomes a hallmark of blogging. It was about his father, a wry, humanistic, sensitive man, but also, as he puts it, an intolerant, spiteful bastard. This, by the way, is right after his father had committed suicide, and Justin had been the last person to see it. Justin decides to share it all on the web. And he does what he calls, here's a menu of cool shit. He later did it as Justin's links from the underground. But it was a way to say, here's some really great pages I have found on the web, because otherwise you're not gonna know about them because there's no such thing as a search engine yet. I'm gonna create the first web directory that allows you to find out what's cool on the web. He was a hardcore fan of Jane's Addiction. So he has a list of bootlegs from Jane's Addiction and Porno for Pyros, where you can peer-to-peer -peer share. There's before Napster, but he's sharing the bootleg editions of it. For some reason, he has a picture of Cary Grant taking a hit of acid. And he shows that Wired Magazine has now gone online. And here's all sorts of other great online things, music, etc. And he dedicates a section to Al Gore, the information toll road's first official pedestrian. This is 1993, just as the Gore Act is kicking in 
and allowing average people like Justin Hall of Swarthmore College to get on the internet. And of course, being a sophomore, and you can remember what that, that was like, being a sophomore meant that he was mainly interested in sex. And so there's an enormous amount, most of which I will not show here, of him finding sites online that have sex, sex online, that shows pictures of people doing things, um, and he even bonds with the futurist, Howard F Rheingold. He's never met him, but they're emailing back and forth about why censoring cyberspace is dangerous. So he writes about free speech, and that for him mainly means sex. Sex dispatch, freedom on the wane, Carnegie Mellon moves to ban erotic news groups. Uh, so there he is fighting for his right to see sex pages online. He finally gets to meet Howard Rheingold. There's him and Howard Rheingold together. Howard Rheingold was a writer who wrote a whole lot about internet communities and about the importance of what he called virtual communities and letting the internet not just be a site for publishing, but a site where people could form communities, express themselves, do this sort of web blogging that people were doing, but have citizen participation in the web, user-generated content. And so Howard Rheingold was hired by the new magazine Wired to help create a site called Hotwired, where people would contribute their own blogs, their own uh, stories. It would be user-generated content. In the days before social media, well before Facebook, there's Howard Rheingold, and he hires Justin as an intern, and Justin goes to work for one summer at Hotwired. And what uh, Howard Rheingold and Justin Hall try to do is turn Hotwired into a site that would be for user content, for people to post things. The way we now do on social media, but Louis Rosetta, the guy there, who was a friend of mine, we had brought Time Magazine and then Wired Magazine to the web on the same day. Um, he decided that no, Hotwired should be a publishing medium. In other words, it shouldn't have a whole lot of amateur generated user content and postings. It should have stories that were reported and edited by the editors of Wired. So Justin and Howard Reinkold hightail it. Justin goes around the country, almost like a Johnny Appleseed, saying, in return for giving me room and board, I'm going to teach you how to start your own little website. It was before the word blog even quite existed. It was still called web logging, but people would log what they did on their website, and eventually the word becomes blog. And so he goes around spreading the gospel of the joy of web logging. Uh, one of the things that Justin's um, list of cool shit or Justin's links from the underground that he started to do, what it does is it spawns some more professional ways of doing directories and eventually search on the internet. About a year after Justin put up his site, there are four or five uh, groups that are then doing a little bit more serious ways of a directory of what you can find on the web. There's Lycos and Alta Vista and Excite, and eventually Yahoo, by the way, founded by a Tulane student. One of them was a Tulane student. And you can see a little bit like Justin Hall, they just list all the things you can find on the internet there's a little bar right there where you can search through the directory. But that back then it was called directory and search because most of the people doing these things thought that people weren't going to just do random word searches and they thought random word searches weren't going to get you very much. So they hired a whole lot of people to make directories where you could look at business and the economy or education, universities, K through 12, entertainment links, movies, music. In other words, people uh, they thought people were going to navigate the web 
by using a directory like an index to look up good websites as opposed to a search engine. We'll get to the notion that Larry Page and Sergey Brin had that search rather than directory would be the way people would keep up with what's on the web. But that's this notion of a web directory is one of the things that Justin Hall helped launch. The other thing, of course, was the blog. The blog was something that seemed odd at first. You know, by the mid 1990s with the Huffington Post and many other places, a whole lot of people, 50 million people at a certain point, had their own blog. Some people would say, that's weird. Why would you be giving me too much information about your life, telling me what you had for breakfast, giving me all of your ideas? But I found the notion of blogging to be really interesting, not just the great professional bloggers like Andrew Sullivan, but just the normal people who otherwise, if they're watching TV, it's not interactive, they're not engaging in things. Blogging allowed people to have a way to engage in things. People like myself who worked for the New Orleans Times Picayune and then worked for Time Magazine, if we wanted to publish something, we could. But for 99% of the country, if you wanted to get something published, your best bet was to try to write a letter to the editor of the newspaper and see if they accepted it. Finally, blogging comes along and people can be more civically engaged, people can express their opinions. And even if it's boring opinions or dumb opinions or just what I had for breakfast, type blog, at least it was getting people engaged in communicating rather than just sitting back and consuming media that came across the television set. And that brings in the person who really professionalized it. This is Ev Williams. Ev Williams was a uh, kid born in Nebraska, loved bicycling, but, but he gets himself to San Francisco and eventually he creates a company, a bootstraps, a company almost from nothing. He was bankrupt called Blogger. And what it did, there it is on the top left, it allowed you to create your own blog. Because if you were Justin Hall creating a blog, you had to download the software from you know, NCSA, Mosaic, browser software and HTML coding. This made it easy, you just had a box, you typed what you wanted into the box, you hit a button that said publish, like Steve Jobs, and, by, and for that matter, Nolan Bushnell doing video games. It's keep it simple. So he made a simple way for people to blog. He ends up, Evan Williams, moving on and founding Twitter, which is a way for people to do short blogging. He gets, of course, disenchanted with Twitter, so his third way of allowing people to engage and express their own opinions is Medium, which Medium is a way, unlike Twitter, which are just really short, fast comments, Medium is a way to actually publish your thoughts, probably in a more polished fashion than you would in a blog. They have writing tips and formats, but you could uh, create your site in Medium and great people like Steve Levy, who we've talked about, the great journalist, they have now sites on Medium where they're getting to be like Substack, a place where you can express opinion and people might even pay to read them. And that, of course, all of that leads to Mark Zuckerberg. There he is at Harvard with his friend Chris Hughes. There they are trying to create a new way that's sort of halfway in between social media and blogging, and that's when they create the culmination of what was started by Justin Hall and what they had first called the Facebook. Welcome to the Facebook. And of course, it becomes what we use today for our way of anything from blogging to posting. It's our way of staying connected, staying engaged, and extending that notion that online should not just be a publishing medium, but it should be a medium where people anywhere, everywhere, get to post whatever they want, their music, their songs, or just their thoughts, or what they had for breakfast, democratizing the internet, just as the original inventors 
of the internet felt it was a medium that would decentralize power and democratize the control of information. Thanks, see you next lecture.